Tire Power gives you the power in their best buys on big brand sale. Get hot offers on the biggest brands, like buy three and get one free on a range of Falcon passenger car tyres. Conditions apply. Tire Power's best buys on big brand sale is on now. Visit tyrepower.com.au. Corpus coming in gold and a the birth of a legend. 458 is the total, out of which Bradman has made 309 not out. It's a world's record. Freeman is too good. The crowd roaring. Freeman wins down. Cappy's the winner. Australia the winner. First ball in Test cricket in England for Shane Moore. And he's done it. He started off with the most beautiful delivery. Yes. To this is your sporting life for Tobin Brothers Funerals, celebrating lives. Here's your host, Sam Edmund. Hello and welcome to another very special edition of This Is Your Sporting Life. Thanks to our great friends at Tobin Brothers Funerals, celebrating lives. Sam Edmund here to celebrate the sporting life of a St Kilda and Melbourne fullback and a Tasmanian football Hall of Famer. Jamie Shanahan played 162 AFL games as an excellent defender who had a fine record against some of the game's greats. Jamie, welcome to the program. Thanks very much, Sammy. Now, you led a full career in so many ways, lots of ups, some downs, but the biggest issue I want to rip into right away, where are the gloves? (laughs) Well, you know, there's been a few times lately where I've been gardening or, um, you know, changing changing a tyre on the car where the gloves would have come in handy. (laughs) <laughs> Again, but um, sadly, all all gone. I think I don't think I have even a pair as a memento. They were outlawed, obviously, years later. You obviously felt there was enough of an advantage at the time that you were getting out of using them. Yeah, look, at, I mean, it was a it was a, it was a double edged sword. It, it made it easier to to, to win possession. Uh, I think they were they were outlawed at junior level before senior level um, by a little bit. It just seemed as though it was on the way out, and I think. Maybe my last year, I decided just to go back to the start and 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 you know back to using you know half a mitt full of grip o on your jumper and obsessively applying it, removing it, reapplying it, and trying to get the right level of attack. You're still obviously involved in footy. You're part of the uh, coaching team down at the Western Bulldogs AFLW. I think you spent a bit of time on the welfare side of footy in the under 18s. How are you coping with it all at the moment? Yeah, the footy. I mean, obviously for everyone, you know, footy's closed down so you know uh, I have a role with the with the Western Jets that, that really kind of stopped as, as soon as it got started but you know looking forward to picking that back up you know as seeing that welfare side uh, the assistant coaching role with the with the Bulldogs women's team was was a great experience you know and I'm really keen to stay involved in that into next season so it was um really re-energised me for footy. I think I'd got to a stage where I had last year, the last sort of winter season off and, and thought, you know, threw my, threw my old footy boots out and thought that might be the might be the last time I need those. Just talking to Berkey about his attitude, and Nathan Berkey, his attitude about what he wanted to do with the, the, the team and the ethos that the club was trying to base their culture around just really appealed to me and, and it was... It's a great experience. They're a really committed group of, of athletes who are, you know, desperate to desperate to improve themselves and, and, and perform well. Now you're born and bred in Tasmania, proud Tasmania. What are your memories of growing up uh, down there? I think you, you played with Hobart in the TFL back in the day. I think you made your senior debut at 16 and you played in the premiership in 1990 as well. I, I was so fortunate when I, was a, when I was a kid to, you know, I grew up in a... In a um, a difficult kind of environment, I guess. You know, it was it was challenging. It was a, it was a, a reasonably poor kind of socio-economic area, and and you know, lots of opportunities to go, you know, the wrong side of the tracks. And luckily, I, I was good enough at football to get to, you know, as you said, to get that chance at a senior club so young. And I, I trained there from on and off from when I was fourteen with Hobart and. You know, the next strike of luck was that there was a group of, of, you know, men there of varying ages who were just really good role models for me and they they uh, taught me a lot of the right lessons about being part of a team and, and responsibility and, and, you know, uh, commitment and what it took to be 
were successful and what, and what you had to give away. And you know, without that, who knows where my life might have headed. But I, I, I remain really thankful that that uh, I arrived at that club when I did, and in, in my life, and at the right stage, you know, in terms of the club, there were some good people there, and and, and it was really good. We, we had a rise. I think my first senior year, I reckon we lost. Oh, we must have lost a lot of games in a row. I think we won one game for the season. We probably, I think we were playing 18 or 20 games at that stage. So, you know, we had uh, we had a significant. I reckon I lost my first 10 senior games in a row. So, it was hard yards. And then, you know, that was 1984, I think. And you know, six or seven years later, at, you know, the same club, after kind of being away and back, but we, we were able to. Play some finals and and you know we lost a grand final in '89 and we won one in '1990. So to see that transition of a club from really struggling to being you know really successful was um, was a lot of fun. You know the, the the lifelong sort of supporters who had done it hard for quite a while. Just the, the the ride that they got in those few years when we we became competitive was really exciting to be part of. You mentioned the fact that you went away and came back. One of those places you went away to was Fitzroy in 86. You did a pre-season there. I think, tell me, even as a ruck forward perhaps, why didn't that work out or was that why you were playing ruck and playing forward? <laughs> Maybe it was. Yeah, I, I was I was playing as a forward then. So uh, I started, I played in the under-19s and, and went okay and then I played a few games in the reserves and, and was kicking a few goals, so I must have been getting lots of shots on goal to to score enough goals because you know I was a fifty fifty bet at best. Um, <laughs> so I think I, you know mid year I got to the I think I was one of the emergencies. It might have been two or three emergencies at that stage, and I had one of those you know out the corner of the mouth conversations with one of the selectors of you know if you if you play another good game we'll probably give you a game in the seniors and went out. Coincidentally, to the Western Oval on a on a wet, cold morning, and uh, got my collarbone broken in the first quarter, which set me back about eight weeks, nine weeks. It was an almost compound fracture, and I, I came back for one game at the end of the year and was really tentative and 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 terrible, and just really struggled during the next off season. I'd lost confidence and was probably. You know, following that injury, it was the first time footy had been really hard, like really hard, um, without any feeling that I was getting anywhere. And uh, my club in Hobart chased me to come back, and uh, you know, tail between the legs, I kind of ran, ran back down to Hobart and, and spent four years trying to find a way to get another a second chance. That second chance came via St Kilda. Tell us, how did it come about with the Saints? It was a t- it was a typically frustrating, you know, footy experience for, you know, and and anyone who spent a bit of time on the on the fringe at a AFL club trying to break in would would, would relate to this, you know, and perhaps in any in any club where you're trying to break in. Uh, um, I first heard from uh, my. Um, Former coach, one of my former coaches at Hobart, Peter Hudson, who was the chairman of selectors at the Saints. And it was late 1989. When he said, we're pretty keen on drafting you. You've had a good year. And, you know, would you would you move to Melbourne? And, I, you know, geez, that's a tough question. I'm going to uproot everything. We, you know, I just started this new career. And kind of agonised over the whole decision and decided that I, that I would. Went back with that, and uh, you know, the conversation was, "Well, great, the draft's in a couple of weeks. We'll be, you know, we'll stay in touch, and we'll, we'll pick you with our last pick in the draft." And that that conversation kind of happened again a couple of times, and then draft day came. It wasn't televised, of course, in those days. I don't think it was on the radio, and it um, came at you know two o'clock, turned into four o'clock and five o'clock, and I thought, "Oh, this is." There's no, there's no congratulatory phone call coming here, and um, they'd uh, they'd decided at the last minute to um, to pick a fellow called Jody Arnold, fellow Tasmanian, who I was playing against in Hobart at the time. Well, there was a whole lot of noise about nothing, and you know I'm definitely giving up on this idea. It's it's you know, that's it. It's it's done. 
you know, almost 12 months later, so, so, you know, a repeat phone call from Hutto with the same question, are we definitely really keen to pick you this year and uh, we'll use our last pick and would you come? And I just said, yeah, of course I would, absolutely. <laughs> and didn't give it a minute's thought. <laughs> you know, you know, got off the phone and thought, oh, that was another waste of, waste of five minutes. That won't happen. And proceeded to make no plans or preparation for anything and then, you know, draft day... The end of 1990, got the phone call shortly after. Yep, yeah, we've picked you, and we need you here in two weeks. Yeah, so you were uh, picked. You were picked 92 in 1990, and you joined the Ken Sheldon coached Saints. And I think you spent a year in the twos, and then you finally got your chance. You got your chance. <laughs> pretty easy assignment. First up, West Coast in Perth, 1992. They would win the premiership that year, of course. Round three. As a 24-year-old. Now, Danny Frawley's alongside you as the fullback. Up the other end, you've got a bloke named Tony Lockett, 26 years old, in his absolute prime. There's Winmar. There's Stewie Bucketslow. Uh, Rob Harvey. Stars everywhere. Your head must have been spinning. Well, look, it was. And even, you know, there wasn't much chance at least to be nervous about it because what um, what happened is that, that I think Russell Morris had had pulled out of the team with a hamstring injury. But there were two spots available. I wouldn't announce the team. I announced a squad of, including two emergencies, myself and, and Darren Davies. And so we flew over to Perth thinking, oh, well, there's two emergencies and two spots. Well, we must be playing. And then we arrived the day before the game and met up with uh, Dale Kickett and, and Kenny Sheldon said to us, oh, Dale's your new teammate, we've just drafted him, he's playing tomorrow. After everyone had said hello to, to, to Sleepy, we we then looked at each other, Buzz and I, and thought, well, one of us is not playing. We went the whole night not knowing, you know, basically we came out of the hotel the next day to get on the bus to go to the ground, and Kenny grabbed us, you know, one at a time, and one bloke got on the bus feeling pretty miserable, and one was pretty happy, but, um, so lucky, you know, it was me, but... A really bizarre build-up or lack of build-up to the game. Actually, I cut you a year short. You did a two-year apprenticeship in the VFL, so you really were made to earn your stripes to get that crack before you made your debut. But once you did in 92, you didn't look, look back. You played the 22 games. You played two finals in your in your first senior year, so life was pretty good. And then you followed that up with another 20 in 1993, but the coach was gone. Kenny Sheldon wasn't going to be reappointed, and a man by the name of Stan Alves stepped in, and it was a bit of a slow build from then on, wasn't it? And we'll get to 1997 later, but what are your memories of that coaching changeover? The group were really disappointed in the sense that, that Ken was a real... Um, he was a coach he just wanted to play well for. He he was a great... Um, I was going to say people manager, but I, I don't know whether it was as deliberate as that. I just think he was a great people person. Um you know, he, he invested in time in people and he, he made, he, he was challenging, but he also really made you feel valuable in, in what you were doing. And so we, we loved playing for Ken. Um, you know, strategically at times we we fell short against um, particular teams that matched up well against us. But, you know, we're, you know there are times, you know, within teams where you think, a change of coach will be a great thing and a breath of fresh air and it may be needed and there are times when you're really unsure about whether it's a good idea or not. I think we're probably the latter at that stage. So, you know, and you could see it towards the end of 93, you could see that things unravelling a bit and that it was maybe heading that way and that was a pretty tough situation. As a team, when you're not performing that well, it's all good for the coach to get the sack but you feel a bit of a bit of collective responsibility that you know, if you were performing better, that wouldn't happen. You're listening to This Is Your Sporting Life for Tobin Brothers Funeral Celebrating Lives. We've just list, lifted the lid on the career of Jamie Shanahan. Next, we'll turn to 1997 and that grand final matchup with Darren Jarman. You're listening to This Is Your Sporting Life with Sam Edmund for Tobin Brothers Funerals Celebrating Lives. Welcome back to This Is Your Sporting Life for Tobin Brothers Funerals, celebrating lives. Welcome back. We are chatting with former St Kilda and Melbourne stopper Jamie Shanahan for Tobin Brothers Funerals, celebrating lives. Well, Jamie, your Saints, they started the 1997 season slowly. In fact, 
You were one and four after the first five rounds. You suffered a loss to Fremantle in round five. Now, what changed after that loss to the Dockers? Because after that, you only lost three games for the rest of the season, and you went on a winning run from round 16 through to the grand final. There was a, there was obviously a bit of talent there, but um, we hadn't you know, made the most of it. So yeah, at that point in '97, it was pretty frustrating. We thought, God, we we, we you know we, this could be easily another season done and dusted if it goes much further. So it was a pretty interesting time. We had a a team meeting after the game called by Stan where where he kind of ripped through everyone and you know, pointed out everyone's inadequacies and what they hadn't done that it can, or had done that had contributed to the loss. So we came out of that onto a, uh, and, and got home you know, to a Monday night review. I think there was just this kind of lingering feeling with the, within the group that you know, it was all well and good to, to bag the players, but if we were a team as a, as a club and a, and a you know, coaches, players all in together, then everyone had to carry some responsibility. So I you think know, it came out in a in the meeting, you know, and and it reached a point where where Stan sort of stood up and said, "Well, look, if you guys, you guys have got some questions, if you don't think I'm the coach to take you through to success, then I'll you know, tell me, and I'll just step aside." And and one of the players kind of there's this awkward silence. One of the players, you know, piped up and said, "Oh no, Stan, you know, we don't need to do that." And then Nicky Wimmer voiced up and he said, "Ah." Oh, uh, Stan, that's a pretty big that's a pretty big statement you put out there. You need to give us some time so you get a proper answer, which was which was a great intervention by Nicky. You know, it, it, because that's something that could have just been, you know, glossed over and nothing might have changed. So Stan sort of said, "Well, I'll be in my office. You blokes, when you're finished, come and knock on the door." We had a pretty robust discussion for well, I don't know how long. Seemed like a hell of a long time. <laughs> And it was quite surreal because you, you get that realization that you know if 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 the group had gone one way, you could be you know playing the next game with a new coach potentially. How many players, Jamie, roughly thought it wasn't a good idea for Stan to continue? Was there a group or none, or how did it manifest itself when he'd left the room? Uh, do you know? Look, it never went to a it never never like it went to a vote where um, you would be able to gauge that. I, I think there were definitely. You know, there were there were probably a number of players who thought that that, that might be a good thing. Um, there were a number who probably weren't fussed either way, and then you know there were some who didn't agree. So there was a real mix, and, and we had a really good discussion as a group about you know what what does it mean if you're involved in a in, in a group where you you kind of asked your your coach what does that say about your your group and does that mean you know we're just scapegoating the coach and he's he's the one to blame and we've got no responsibility? Um, and and some pretty honest discussions like that. Hypotheticals. If you did go that way, well your season's done straight away. If you bring in a new coach and a new playing style and you know you've got another year of building and we've been trying to build for a while to to have a chance of success. So you know with some really great honest kind of input we got to a stage where we we decided and really did decide as a group i think that the, the only chance for us to be successful was to for for us as a playing group to deliver on what we needed to and we needed the coach and, and the coaching group to deliver on what they needed you know in terms of giving us the right instructions and feedback and and then as a, we got stan back in and said look you know we want you to stay as a coach but we also think we need to change some of the ways that, that a couple of things are happening. We, we agreed on some different measures for, for what success might look like for the team and and then our job as a playing group was to really deliver on those and and I think, you know, it was a pretty powerful process that, that drove a real turnaround because everyone had a feeling that they, they had to contribute in order for us to get anywhere near what we hoped we might get. Well, you smashed Melbourne the next week. Uh, you took care of Brisbane easily in the qualifying final. Then you took care of North Melbourne easily in the preliminary final. And you found yourself in a grand final against the upstart Adelaide Crows. And you led at halftime by 13 points. So halftime of the grand final, you're up by just a tick over two goals. What was it like in the rooms with Stan, halftime of the grand final, with the team up by two goals? We got to the grand final. We're, we hadn't played really well to that point, 
uh, of the game, I don't think. Like we're 12, you know, you're 12 points up in the grand final. We hadn't played well, and you think, God, we, you know, we we didn't often go through games never kind of getting getting it to click. And you know, he thought, geez, if we can pull it together in the in the third quarter and and get a bit of real control in the game, uh, we might really be able to do something here. And that was the feeling that we had going off the ground. And, you know, I think we... Uh, I've got a feeling we got a good old-fashioned bake at half-time and it was, you know, a bit of the kind of post frio style thing where, you know, there was a lot of... There was a lot of identifying who hadn't done what right or who had done what wrong. So... Um, I reckon we came out at three quarter time a bit flattened, mm. to be honest. So, um, you know, and I reckon the game continued that way. We never really, as a team, got it together. Uh, we, we weren't terrible, but we weren't playing well, and and the game was kind of sitting there waiting for one team or the other to actually really grab it and. Um, and assert their authority, and, and the Crows did that in the last quarter, and um, did, did it pretty kind of comfortably in the end, you know, scoreboard-wise. But we, you know, we hung on. I mean, I think the band margin was was thirty points. Is that there was a period of there was a passage of play with maybe maybe around the twenty-minute mark when or well, thereabouts we had a we had a long kind of shot on goal from just out near 50 that we knew wasn't going to make the distance and we, we had a set play about where the ball would get kicked and um, and you know it all came together and unfortunately the, the, the player in that spot didn't take the mark you know and you, I think we were maybe 18 points down at that stage you know if you kick that goal you're 12 points down and you've, you've just uh, you know still got 10 minutes to play so that was our real last chance to, to hang in the game and we just couldn't pull it off so you know, they. Um, I reckon they cleared the ball from that bit of play straight up the ground and scored. And all of a sudden, you're four goals down, and, and the game's out of your reach. The second half of this grand final, you know, was obviously the Darren Jarman show. I think he kicked six, five goals coming in a last quarter frenzy. Now, your career in many ways is unfairly defined by this game. I'm not sure if you feel the same way, but you conceded on average 1.6 goals a game that year. And then a freakishly talented player ran ridiculously hot in the last half hour of the game. Yeah, yeah, it's. Um, I mean, it's pretty disappointing when you, you know, my 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 career was and the focus of it was really stopping players doing that. And you know, if you could break even, um, you know, playing a lot of guys who averaged four or five goals a game, and if you could keep them to, you know. One or two or three, then you really had a strong chance of winning the game. And I imagine that you know that grand final is the same. You know, if, if I think you know in the first three quarters, I think Charles had kicked a goal, so you'd say it's kind of going to plan at that stage. And if he kicks one for the last quarter, we're probably really in the mix. So you know, to say that it's unfair, you know, that it defines my career, I, I don't know whether that's true or not. I mean. You know, that's you kind of live by the sword and you, you die by it a little bit. Um, in terms of the balance of numbers, I, you know, I think I had a lot more success in in kind of holding players versus blowouts. But um, but that's the one that, that that's kind of there on public display the most prominently. So, um, you know, there's a period in the game where where Andrew McLeod came down the wing with the ball and 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 uh, I, I had a good starting spot, and Jarman led towards the boundary, and then and I, I had him coming off. Thought, you know, this is I'm going to punch this about five rows deep over the fence. Um, this is this is a good spot. And then McLeod looked, and he saw the same thing. He said, oh, I'm not going to kick it there. And then he waited, and it felt like he almost stopped and, and had a look around behind him, and had a bounce and started running again. And it, it could be exaggerated, but. Um, we, we then, you know, there was a second lead and a third lead, and I think the ball ended up going over my back shoulder. And I stand there thinking, if 
you know, I'm playing on this guy. If he's got time to lead two or three or four times, I'm in a lot of trouble because mm. you just can't keep contact with players who are, who are agile when they make that many moves. You know, you, the first one you might be set up right, and the second you can hang on, but many more than that, and you, and you just lose contact. So I thought I was in for a, potentially for a pretty tough time, and I was right. <laughs> you know, but um, I hadn't watched that game at all until uh, must have been late last year. I, I watched it as the lead up to doing a a talk with some kids at Cedar College for for Are You OK Day, and I, you know, um, it kind of tied in with my experience after that grand final. Uh, so it worked to use the footage and and that, you know. Looking back on it with a, with a lot of time to spare, I also look and think, you know, the, the ball came in really hot, but geez, I was, I was pretty ordinary in a few plays. You know, I kind of got what I deserved <laughs> yeah. in that moment. So, you know, um, hard to hard to watch when you when you um, it's always hard to watch yourself, but you know, when you're doing well, it's sometimes hard to watch. But when you're not, it's pretty challenging. But um, you know objectively as, as much as you can you know look at it and think well it was a pretty poor effort that one and there was a, geez, that, I got that wrong and um, I could have done it and I didn't, didn't choose the right option there so you know you look back and, and it kind of makes sense unfortunately but um, yeah those one of the one of the comforting kind of calls I got was from a an old coach of mine Mark Browning the former Sydney Swans captain and he passed on some advice he he got from his dad, which was that you know the longer you play in the back line, you know, and every game that goes by, you're a game closer to someone kicking a bag of goals on you. Mm. And when it happens, you, you just got to find a way to deal with it. And if you can't cope with that type of situation when it comes, then you got to think his words were going players are forward. Jamie, so, did it take you a long time to process? I mean, the aftermath. Any time you lose a grand final, obviously it it would hurt immensely. Um, but having gone through what you went through and being perhaps so much more personal than many of your teammates, given what transpired with Darren Jarman, did it take you a while you felt to process? Uh, well, it's interesting because at the time I would have said probably not, um, but I don't know whether that means I processed it quickly or I just shelved it. You know, um, you know the link for me with the, with the the um, whole Are You OK concept was that I got some really valuable support from, from people you know, involved in footy and not involved in footy just to kind of reach out and say, God, you sound like you're getting a pretty hard time over this. Um, I didn't think it was warranted that or I didn't think you were that bad. I think you did this right. You didn't some objectives, some support, you know, some really kind of um, worthwhile practical breakdown of, of what had happened and mixed with support and, and encouragement and um, and the fact that just people would, would kind of say, you know, it's pretty rough, you're going okay, uh, really helped me to, to refocus and, and um, you know, I just took that attitude that if you, you know, there were plenty of days where I had average performances and the team performance covered that up and, and, I, and I wasn't, you know, you kind of people go, well, you, you played well and you think I didn't, but, you know, the guy I'm on didn't perform, but that really wasn't too much my doing. Mm. And other days when it might be the opposite, you know, you had really good days and the team struggled and you get goals kicked on you and, you, and it's deemed that you played poorly based on the scoreline, but you actually think you went okay. Um, and so I got into a habit of trying to be pretty, you know, self-reflective on what I actually thought really happened performance-wise and try not to get too emotional about it. So I think I really stuck into that and, and tried to sit with it. And um, I don't think that it... You know, my next year, I, I felt pretty positive and played some good footy. So, uh, But, you know, that's counted with the fact that it took me 20 years to to um, watch the watch the replay of the game. So it's probably hard to say you've processed and dealt with it Yeah, it, when you also say that. Before we leave it, though, Jamie, I mean, the pre-season of 97, obviously re-watching the matchup, it's quite a curious one in the sense that 
you've got him well and truly covered for power and weight, and he's got a lot more agility. There was a story going around, if it's true, the preseason of 97, that you'd actually wanted to lose some weight and be more agile. Is that on the money? Yeah, it is. It is. And that was um, it was really frustrating at the time when it, when it kind of played out in, in the, the grand final that way, but also, you know, pretty instructive for me on taking control of your own game. But what, what happened at the end of... I started my career, when I started in I think midway through 91 at the Saints, I was 87 kilos and, and lean, but matching up against some big guys and powerful athletes at uh, key forwards, I was really struggling to compete physically in, in, in one-on-one contests. So I had to get stronger and I, I trained hard in the gym. I, I changed my diet so that I was more able to put on some muscle and you know, probably, I don't know what point, you know, two or three, four, three or four years later, I was, you know, mid-season 109 kilos. So, and still around the same body fat. So, pretty significant change. And, you know, early in my career, I think at the end of 92, I'd played on on uh, Peter Dacos in a, in a final against Collingwood. And a pretty agile man, Pete. <laughs> um, pretty zippy. And... And been able to hang on, you know, just, but but hang on well enough. Um, and then, uh, you know, of course, when the ball comes in in the air, I, I had an advantage. So, but, um, you know, with another 20 kilos on board, I, I couldn't do that. And at the, at the end of 96, I, I just thought that some of those big, powerful forwards were leaving the game. You know, gradually, you know, guys, you know, Stephen Kernan had left Carlton and you know, I was replaced by, by guys like Brad Pierce and Simon Beaumont and they just rotated through with with mid-sized mm. agile players until something clicked. And and I remember going to the, the the kind of coaching and fitness staff and saying, I really reckon I've got to lose five or six kilos and be be more suited to the variety of you know, opponent, and at that stage, they're very much in the blanket rule of everyone did the same thing, and, and we couldn't, you know, well, we're not making any concessions for anyone. You've got to do the same training as everyone else. And I thought, oh, maybe they haven't, maybe I didn't explain that properly. So I went, I went, you know, a bit more long winded in explaining my reason and why I thought I should and how I could do this. I've kind of got some blank looks and the same, you just, you just train the same as everyone else and do what you're told which I kind of did to my own detriment. I was pretty strong on following the rules and, and doing, the, doing what the team kind of required and, and fulfill, you know, tick every box and fulfill all your obligations and all that stuff. But, you know, in the end, that didn't help me when it really counted. It didn't help the team either. You're listening to This Is Your Sporting Life for Tobin Brothers Funeral Celebrating Lives. We heard Jamie Shanahan just touch on his move to Melbourne. We'll get his recollections of that move before the 1998 season to the D's on the other side of this. You're listening to This Is Your Sporting Life with Sam Edmund for Tobin Brothers Funerals, celebrating lives. Welcome back to This Is Your Sporting Life for Tobin Brothers Funerals, celebrating lives. You're listening to This Is Your Sporting Life for Tobin Brothers Funerals, celebrating lives. We're chatting with former Saints and Demons defender, Jamie Shanahan. Well, Jamie, after 97, you wanted a two-year contract to stay at Moorabbin, but the Saints were only offering the one. You decided it was time to move. It was a pretty confusing time. I mean, obviously, we had the real disappointment of, uh, of losing the grand final. But, you know, in the middle of the... Kind of sometime during the year, there'd been a conversation between my management and the club about getting a two-year contract and they'd kind of initially started and, and put forward a figure and then they'd come back and said actually we, we don't want to talk to anyone about contract until the end of the year uh, and then the end of the year obviously would come and, and then they um, wanted to sign a few other players who were out of contract first, offered a one year deal then they withdrew that and wouldn't put anything on the table and it just became this drawn out situation and my, my fear was that it would we kind of went through the trading period and I thought, well, God, oh, let's see if they're serious. So I tried to be traded. I had this feeling that it was heading towards we'll just stall and drag it out until we get past that, you know, nomination deadline and then I would be stuck, you know, 
playing for a couple of tram tickets and some takeaway dinners. So um, I had to make a call, you know, and and I was I would have been a pain in the neck to to look after at that stage. I was really hesitant. I wanted someone else to make the decision. I, I wanted the club to either say we want you or we don't want you. For me not to have to decide because I didn't want to leave. At that stage, Melbourne had nominated an interest in Peter Matera. Hawthorne had the second pick. And while this had all been going on, that they'd come in and said, well, you know, we, we want you to come play here. We'll offer you three years, guaranteed. Uh, I thought that at that stage I, I would end up there. They were pretty confident that Melbourne were going to get Matera. And I, I chased it up and it turns out that he'd, uh, he'd had a night uh, with his, rounded up by his West Coast teammates and they'd, they'd put the acid on him and he pulled out of, he pulled out of the move to Melbourne. Nothing, nothing was kind of happening anywhere. The next day, I got a call from Neil Danaher, and he said, oh, "I reckon we need to have a talk. Why don't you come in?" That was the start of me, me heading to Melbourne. Grand yeah. finalist of the Wooden Spoon. I don't know if people thought you were crazy. Neil, I think, was in his first year, wasn't he, Jamie? And, and probably even a pretty hard taskmaster straight off the bat, I would imagine. Well, he was, and uh, Neil had coached um, coached me in, in one of the one or two of the Allies teams, which was, you know. All the minor states banded together trying to compete against yep. against the, the the big footy states, and um, I, you know when I was a kid, I had a, I had a, I had a number six on the back of an Essendon jumper, which was Neil's number. So I, you know I was I was pretty happy to be coached by him in a rep side. The thought of being coached by Neil, you know, in a in a club, uh, I didn't care whether they were bottom of the ladder or not. I was pretty happy with that idea. Um, you know, but kind of having that up close experience with a with a childhood hero was was like a dream come true. So um, I couldn't wait to get in and talk to him really. Uh, and Melbourne did a, Cameron Schwab was was CEO and uh, did a really great job of of managing the whole process. You know, it was clear that. If they decided they wanted to, to pick me, you, you don't have any choice in it. Um, but they were great. They they outlined what their their vision for the club was and what what they were trying to do in terms of building a team and how they were doing that and what what I might be able to contribute and and really presented as here's what we're doing. We really want to give you the space to choose to come and play here because we think that's the best way for this process to work. Uh, it was pretty empowering to feel as though you had some choice where, where really you probably didn't. But, you know, if I compare how I felt in going, how positive I felt in going to Melbourne, despite the latter position, compared with how I might have felt if they'd just rung me and said, well, we're picking you whether you like it or not, you know, get on board. Mm. Oh, it was a great it was a great example of, of you know, leadership from, from Neil and Cameron and how to manage a situation for the best result for everybody. Yeah, well, that first year with the Demons, you managed to win over the Saints in the finals for good measure and the Crows. You had a good year all the way to the prelim before going down to North Melbourne. And then 2000, oh, look, you signed off in a nice way, I think, a premiership at VFL level as well to put a nice full stop on in the playing career. It was a funny year. You, know, you mentioned going from, from uh, the ladder leader at the end of the season and, and a grand finalist to the Wooden Spooners. And, and I remember being sent a... A newsletter from the, like a cheer squad newsletter by a guy who was obviously very aggrieved with me leaving the club. And you know, he'd, he'd kind of written in there was an article on, you know, look at this loser going from the top club to the wooden spooners, what a moron. Yeah. We never liked you anyway, good riddance. <laughs> that kind of sentiment. <laughs> yep. And um, I was pretty, pretty peeved about that. But um, funnily enough, you know, the, the, we clashed with the Saints, you said, you know, the, the week before the prelim, I yeah, think. Yeah, semi-final. One yep. by nine goals. And, yeah, and um, I couldn't find that bloke to give him some feedback <laughs> that I had for him, yep. <laughs> that I'd been holding on to for, a, for the best part of a year. So uh, it, was a, it, was a, it was a great year, 98. We, we just ran out of steam against North. Um, 99 was a tough year for, for the club. We struggled and then 2000 really bounced back and for me personally it was injury riddled and I, and I played out my time with Sandingham in the VFL for the, for the last half of 2000. But, but uh, yeah, my, my final game was a premiership in the VFL and sat through the following week was, was the, the AFL grand final that the Demons played in and, and got pasted by Essendon. So it was a real... Mm. Contrast, you know, you're ever optimistic. I had this idea that, you know, 
maybe I'd be able to hang on and some miracle would happen and I'd get to play in that game as well. But, um, you know, probably, fortunately, that, that didn't happen. And, <laughs> and uh, you know, I finished, finished on a positive, which was, uh, which was a nice way to, to round things off. Oh, absolutely. We're chatting to Jamie Shanahan here on This Is Your Sporting Life. Thanks to Tobin Brothers Funeral Celebrating Lives. We'll be back with more after this. You're listening to This Is Your Sporting Life with Sam Edmund for Tobin Brothers Funerals Celebrating Lives. Welcome back to This Is Your Sporting Life for Tobin Brothers Funerals Celebrating Lives. Well, it's been great to have your company here on This Is Your Sporting Life. Thanks to Tobin Brothers Funerals. Jamie Shanahan has taken us on a trip down memory lane today. Well, Jamie, now, as you look back on it, are you a saint or are you a demon? An affinity for both clubs, and I and and I would say that that's probably you know a lightweight one. I'm not I'm not strongly kind of committed you know in any way or not involved with either particularly. Um, so you know it's it's I'm a kind of a I'm a, a bit of a distant follower, I guess. Um, you know, the more recent was the demons a really positive experience, but for a short period of time and and. Probably the one thing that's endured mostly is relationships with with some of the guys I spent a lot more time with at the Saints, and so you know, 20 years on, that's probably the the key thing. So I guess that probably you know leans me more towards the Saints than the Dees. Yeah, well, defenders didn't sneak forward much in your day; it just wasn't the done thing like perhaps it is now. I mean, you're the target of a few interesting trivia questions. What about what about this one, though, Jamie? You're the fourth. I'm sure you don't need reminding. You're the fourth longest serving AFL player never to have kicked a goal. Zero goals, five behinds. In fact, I think four of those five behinds came in that great year in '97 on the way to the grand final. Um, how do you reconcile with the fact you just couldn't quite land the snag? Couldn't quite land it. You know. It's amazing how tight those footy jumpers get around your neck when you line up in front of goal. I choked a few times. I had some I had some really easy, easy shots on goal. I had one shot from 25 metres and didn't make the distance. <laughs> um, I might have been wet, but I, you know that's probably not much of a of an out. Um, I reckon I had I had a shot at Waverley, and I, I don't know. I reckon we were playing maybe three man all. And I, I actually reckon that the ball went over the line and the wind blew it back and it hit the back of the goalpost to score a point. So I was pretty stiff. <laughs> Justin Pickett was next to me and he had both fists up and he was starting to cheer. I don't know if you recall all five of your Brownlow votes, but you're, another part of uh, history, the footnote on your career, Jamie, is you got three best on ground, the last ever game at Moorabbin, and that was round 20, 1992 your Saints against Fitzroy in an 18-point victory for the Saints and you were best on ground. I've tried to... I've offered that up as a trivia question to a number of people <laughs> who've, who've been running trivia nights or uh, some guys I know do a bit of radio. I reckon I threw it up to Bob Murphy that he could use as a trivia point. I don't, I don't recall hearing that he has. Shame on you, Bob. Um, so, uh, <laughs> so um, yeah, it's... Uh, it's my sole claim to fame in in those stakes, in, as far as uh, best on ground things and um, and the like. So, you know, I'll uh, I'll hold on to that. You hold on to the the small pearls you've got. Well, Jamie, you've been so generous with your time, and I'm so glad you were. I've enjoyed every minute of it. What a fascinating career it has been for you. An amazing journey in footy, and you gave so much of yourself to the game. And thanks for your time too. You've been listening. To This Is Your Sporting Life for Tobin Brothers Funeral Celebrating Lives. We'll catch you next week to celebrate the life of another sporting icon.